I'm going to um, you know uh, make this uh, small because I'm not sure everyone needs to um, see this so that it's clutter free. My talk will be about automated data visualization techniques and machine learning uh, related to uh, some kind of an automation. My um, uh, previous firm I was an investment bank and uh, the CIO used to always ask this question, <laughs> why is my data science team taking so long um, to complete uh, what he thought was a simple project? And um, our answer was always about, uh, you know, uh, this uh, not working and uh, if only we had better tools, uh, better frameworks um, and uh, more technology, uh, we would all be more productive. Um, the answer actually turns out to be quite uh, kind of similar across the industry. Machine learning teams still uh, tell their managers, at least uh, in surveys, that they are struggling to take advantage of uh, machine learning because they, they're finding that there are a lot of uh, inflexible frameworks, a lack of reproducibility in the results. So if they were to create a model in a tool, that tool, uh, what results it's producing, they're not able to reproduce it. And collaboration, uh, there are not many tools for collaboration, except the Jupyter Notebook, which has done very well for us, and immature uh, software tools. So this is just a, uh, uh, an observation that I wanted to share with you because it's quite common. And um, so I started to wrestle with this question um, about two years ago. And, and, and as I tried to make myself more productive as a data scientist, I found that there were quite a few things that I can do to make myself more productive. One was if I could only do uh, tools uh, that enable faster visualization, I felt that I could gain insights into my data much faster. Second, I felt like uh, I was faced with uh, data sets that were very big, or you know, we can say big data. Um, most of the uh, data scientists, when they get started, they work with the uh, data sets that are very small, like Iris in Boston, uh, housing or, or uh, breast cancer data set or the diabetes data sets. All of them are about 500 uh, rows, if not smaller than that. Uh, and they typically have only about 10, maybe 20, 30 features. All of the data sets in the real world had millions of rows and sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of features. So if a tool could only do automatic uh, feature selection for me, I felt like that would have been a, a great thing. And um, that would be magic. This uh, third thing that I wanted was automatic model selection and tuning. If only we could try a few uh, simple models and see if they worked, and then if we could go to more complex models and then tune them, wouldn't it be all great is what I thought. Lastly, I wanted one-click model serving. I wanted to, once I selected the best model, best features, I wanted to click one button and serve it into production. This is the utopia that we're all looking for, right? Um, however, current tools that promise all of these are limited because they are proprietary and expensive. So if you were to look at um, tools in the market today, most of them are proprietary or they are very expensive. And if you were to buy into them, then you get to the second problem, which is they are black boxes. They're too complex to interpret. And third, they have a problem where you cannot reproduce what the tool is producing outside of the tool. So if you were to see great results from the tool and you try to go to your Jupyter notebook and try to reproduce it, you almost always found that you could not reproduce or you could not explain what the tool did to your bosses, to your customers, to your clients, to your, uh, even your fellow data scientists. So I came up with a way to introduce a simpler approach to AutoML. And you know, today I'm gonna to introduce to you two new tools that are um, open sourced, that I open sourced to the uh, community last, um, about 10 days ago, last week or 10 days ago. And they're now available with a simple click of a button for you to download and be able to use it right away. One is called AutoML and the other is called AutoViz. I, somebody was telling me that I must like the word or the letter V <laughs> too much because I've named them with uh, V in there. But uh, jokes, as, jokes aside, uh, the reason for the V is that the V is for variant, so you can try multiple uh, machine learning models. The I is there for interpretable. I wanted the models to be interpretable. I wanted the tool itself to be interpretable. 
and third is uh, V uh, for Viz is for visualization. So you're going to see how um, these tools work today. Okay. Oh, uh, so I'm just going to interrupt. Uh, I think your video seems like uh, freezed. Uh, I guess probably the you know uh, the internet speed. Uh, maybe you want to yes. turn off your Let's video uh, to. We want to make sure the audio is uh, is clear. Okay, sure. Let me do that. Let me turn off the video. Okay. Uh, so, what is AutoViz and what is AutoML? They are both open source tools for delivering faster time to insights. The design goals were <clears throat> uh, simple. Um, so you could invoke them with a single line of code, each of them. Uh, they're flexible to any kind of structured data. They don't currently at least deal with uh, images. They're incremental. You could, uh, anybody can use them from beginners to uh, experts. And uh, they're experimental. They help you visualize the data in different ways and models step by step. Um, so you, you could experiment with your data and your models. And finally, they're interpretable. They give you clear explanation of the steps that they're taking, along with validation data. So you can see by charts and graphs and, and the steps, clear output, what they're doing step by step. And finally, they're reproducible. There's, these are no black boxes. I've given you the source code. You can, in fact, uh, reproduce the model pipelines in, in a few uh, lines of uh, scikit-learn or TensorFlow code. Uh, the same output that these uh, models are producing. Finally, they're extensible. You can, um, they are open source to the Python community and you can download them with a pip install. So my uh, design goals, uh, those are one, but the final design goal that I had for myself was I built them to make my own life easier. I hope it'll do the same for you. So what is AutoViz? AutoViz enables you to automatically visualize any data set with a single line of code. Yes, <laughs> I know it sounds like a, like a magic or sounds like a, a big a deal, um, but I've simplified it so you can actually see how it works and you can decide for yourself whether indeed it does what it promises. First, I, um, it automatically selects, AutoViz selects uh, a random sample from the data set if the data set is very large. Uh, second, um, it's... Uh, it, it uh, selects the most important features using machine learning if the number of variables is very large. Third, it selects the best methods to visualize data. So you don't have to worry about what charts or graphs you need to produce. And it can uh, be visualized on uh, a Jupyter notebook or you can build your own website to visualize the data. And I'll show you one example of how it does that. Uh, finally, you, we provide charts uh, to be uh, saved in any format you choose. I've given three formats, PNG, JPG, SVG, and you can extend this uh, to anything you want. So why AutoViz? The first um, goal or benefit that AutoViz gives you is it's systematic. Many of the data scientists work with data and produce a few charts which they think are going to wow their audience or that's going to uh, provide them you know, a great insight based on their gut instinct. They think that they know a lot about the domain and they can select the best charts, the best data, the best variables to demonstrate what they think you should know. But AutoViz was not designed that way. It was designed to be systematic. It systematically goes through your data, finds uh, all the charts that it can show about all the variables, and it does not just be, is not partial or it's not biased towards one variable or another, except that if it gets to very large data, and it starts to prune that data set to a smaller size so it can show you the best results, the best charts based on uh, machine learning. So the underlying methods are very systematic. Second, it's simple. It reduces features to the most important ones that you need to deliver powerful, simple but powerful insights. Third, it helps explain. It shows you only those charts, not only, it shows you a lot of charts, but you can uh, select the best ones that explain your hypothesis and variable selection to others. So this is the three primary benefits. Uh, there are more like, you know, speed to insights and time to value and so on, which, you know, I'm not putting in here, but those are also very valid and very important. How does AutoViz work? So here's the design goals. You're going to get, select the best 
features using a uh, powerful machine learning algorithm, XGBoost, which uh, powers out of this. Uh, second, select the best charts. It automatically selects the best charts for you. You'll see how. And then it delivers them fast. It takes only a few uh, seconds to get insights, and we'll see how fast it is in a, in a demo. So implementation, we, we've got variable selection. It, it figures out the problem that you're trying to solve. So if you give the target variable, it automatically figures out whether it's regression, classification, time series, clustering, and more. So you don't have to give a target variable. It'll figure out that it's clustering. If you give it a target variable, it looks at the target variable and sees if it is, if it is a numeric variable, it says it's regression. If it's a, a, a category or it's a string variable, it, it uh, thinks it's classification. If you give it a time, uh, like a date time stamp um, variable inside it, it will start to do time series analysis. So it's very, uh, very good at identifying what you're trying to do. And last, it provides you charts that are more than a simple one dimensional uh, chart. It shows you a powerful uh, insights between multiple variables. How uh, difficult or easy is it to uh, uh, do out of this? It's as easy as one, two, three. First, you install out of this, so you can see the uh, uh, the Python statement for install out of this. It's called pip install out of this, so that's all you have to do. Uh, make make sure that you're using um, the small uh, caps, not, uh, not like uh, capital letters or large caps. Uh, and next, you can use from Autobiz. The Autobiz class is where you have the, we've stored all the charts once you produce them. So the Autobiz class is instantiated by importing Autobiz class, and you instantiate an object known as Autobiz class. And this object is going to store all of your charts in case you want to uh, pro push process them later. But it's not necessary to you know instantiate it. You can go straight to uh, Autoviz itself and uh, Autoviz class dot Autoviz and be uh, able to run it. All that we require is either the file name. In this case, I'm not giving a file name, so it's an empty empty string. What is a separator used in the data set? And that's uh, that could be comma, could be uh, tab, could be uh, hyphen. Any separator that you're using in the data or the data that you need to provide it and target variable. What is the target variable that you're trying to uh, use in this data set? If there's no target variable, you can leave that to be uh, blank or empty string. Uh, last is the data frame. If you have loaded um, the data into a data frame, you can leave the file to be blank and provide the data frame. This is the preferred method that I use, but you can also, if you uh, know where your file is stored, give it just the file name, and you can leave the data frame to be empty string. So Autobus will do its magic. You'll see the results. It'll immediately show you what it is, uh, you know, what it's importing, what's the number of plots it's going to generate, how many seconds it took to ge generate those charts. Typically, you should see for most of your data within one to two minutes of the biggest data sets. For smaller data sets like 500 uh, rows and 14 variables, you're going to see uh, results in 15 seconds. And if you want to go look at the entire uh, code, you can go to the GitHub, uh, GitHub here and download the code. Probably will not do this. They will probably use the pip install and just play with it as is. And that's fine by, you know, by me. All right, so once we do that, what do we get? We get first a scatter plot of each continuous variable against the target variable. So for the Boston housing data set, if you're familiar with the housing data set, we are trying to predict the median value of housing. And in that, we have multiple variables like rooms, age of the building, and so on. You can see that the median value of houses um, goes kind of you know, uh, sloped upward to up to six rooms. And after it goes beyond six or seven rooms, it starts to go very high, very steep. And similarly, you can see if the age of the building starts to go beyond let's say 80, it starts to depreciate very rapidly. The price of the building or the median value starts to fall down. Second, it shows you the uh, multiple, there are multiple charts, I'm just showing you a couple. There's a, a more charts here. This is a, a in pairwise interaction of two continuous variables. One is Knox and the other is the distance. And you can see that this uh, uh, line, which we include uh, if, you, uh, if you set a particular um, flag lowest as, as equal to being true, you can uh, get the results here uh, that will show you a linear regression plot or a, a lowest plot. 
So this shows you that this uh, variable interaction is a complex and nonlinear interaction, similarly between NOx and PT ratio. What do we then see? You then see the dist histograms distribution of all the continuous variables. So you can see that these two variables are highly skewed, left skewed. And these two variables left skewed, this two variables right skewed. You can see the heat map of all the continuous variables, so you can see their correlation to their median value, which is the target variable. So what's the highest uh, target uh, correlation? It's the LSTAT, the uh, lower uh, uh, income uh, stat percentage of uh, folks in, in Boston. And that's got a negative 74%. Uh, that means it's uh, directly oppositely correlated to the median value. So there are more uh, charts that I can show you here. Um, so we are going to go to the demo and um, take a look at it. But in the meantime, I just want you to know um, how to build a better model using AutoML because we might not have the time to look at the demo in, in full form. So I just want to uh, give a few minutes to talk about how does AutoML work. So how do we build a better model once we have visualized it? Once we built, um, uh, once we understand our data set with Autoviz, we want to build a, a, a good model. For that, we need to remove what we consider to be low information variables. Fun, you know, happily or luckily for us, Autoviz does this automatically. So if there are variables that are all the same value or they have a very high correlation to each other, it starts to find those and it starts to, uh, you know, remove them. Second, it, you can add polynomial interaction and other features to your data with one, one uh, statement or one flag. Um, similarly, you can select the models that you want to uh, start with. You can start with simple linear models to complex uh, random forests or, or XGBoost. You can add binning to your data set. It uses a sophisticated method known as entropy binning. You can add stacking variables. So stacking is a, a special um, technique where we use the predictions from uh, previous models as in, uh, as input features to uh, to future models. K-means featureization is another technique where we add a cluster label which clusters the data and provides cluster labels to as features, input features. So these are all uh, nice features to make your model, uh, you know, very, um, I would say, more accurate or, uh, you know, higher uh, precision or higher recall. You can even do imbalanced sampling and training. So we have a flag for imbalanced training and you can set that. And finally, you can do ensembling of multiple types of models, all within one line of code. So what are the benefits of AutoML? AutoML, again, provides the same benefits as AutoViz. It's systematic, so you can build uh, your model from the ground up to mimic how a real data scientist would propose approach a modeling problem. It does automatic feature selection. I found that with AutoML, you can produce models that have 10 to 90% fewer features than regular models. I uh, recently was working on a model with 5,000 features, and it was able to reduce the number of features down to 50. So that's a 99% reduction in number of features without loss of any uh, significant predictive power. So you can try that yourself. You can build multiple models. You can also, it also provides you transparency so you can see what it does. And finally, you can select, uh, you know, uh, additional features that you want to add in case you feel that you, your model requires, uh, uh, you know, a bit more input features. So uh, these are all the uh, things I've talked about. These are all the flags that are available. It uses grid search. You can also try randomized search uh, with, a, with a simple uh, uh, flag. It uh, provides you interactions between variables. So if you just set a flag for creating interaction variables, it will create you uh, uh, polynomials and interaction variables. And finally, in order to get feature importance, we use a special technique called sha shapely values. So you can use SHAP or you can use feature importance, both of them are available. So how do you use AutoML? Again, it's as easy as one, two, three, you pip install AutoML, and from AutoML you import uh, the library called AutoML or the, or the function, and from there you just uh, train a model and uh, test it. So you can uh, call AutoML by uh, say giving the trained data set or a trained data frame, the target variable, the test data frame, and the sample submission. A sample submission is something you would use for like a Kaggle competition. You can uh, provide a data frame with just the ID of the data, 
and then the uh, response variable or the target variable, and it will automatically fill the target variable with its predictions. These are the flags that I've been talking about. So for hyperparameter tuning, you can use grid search or you can use random search. For grid search, you use GS. For random search, you use RS. What are the scoring parameters? What is the uh, target uh, optimization that you want to optimize this model for? If you want to use root mean squared error, you can put in RMSE. Similarly, for feature reduction, you can either reduce features or you can leave the features as they are. Typically, I would set this flag to be true because you want to reduce features that are not needed in your data. But if you feel like very strongly for uh, image data sets or for digits data or for uh, NLP or any number of uh, reasons that you want to not reduce features, you can set this to feature reduction equals false, in which case it will not reduce features. Boosting. So if you want to use HG boost, you say boosting flag equals true. If you want to use random forest, you say boosting flag equals false. And if you want to use a linear model, yeah, you don't. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I think you somehow got it, disconnected. Oh, God. Okay. okay. It's back now. Okay. Okay. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know where we left off. Can you help me where we left off? Um, I think you left off uh, um, a minute ago. Okay, I can see. It. All right, so um, uh, on the page like 30 seconds ago on feature reduction, RMSE. So um, thank you for that. What we uh, are talking about is what are the parameters that you can provide to this uh, out of ML. And um, the first one is, uh, like I said, what is the scoring parameter? It could be RMSE, it could be F1 if it's a classification model, it could be position, it could be recall. Uh, it could be any number of 14 or 15 different parameters that uh, are available. And secondly, you can set the feature reduction flag to be true or false. If you set it to true, it will reduce features. If you set it to false, it will not reduce features. If you set the boosting flag to be none, it means it will not use any boosting or bagging. It will just be a linear model. If you set the boosting flag to be true, it will use a XG boost. If you set the boosting flag to be false, it will use random forest. A k-means featureizer flag is if you consider it to true or false. If you set it to true, you will get an extra feature added to the model for cluster labels. If you set it to false, that feature will not be added. If you add poly, you set it to zero, it means no polynomial variables will be added. If you set it to one, it will add polynomial features, interactions, and polynomial. If you set it to two, it will only add polynomial to the uh, power of two, which means you'll get squared variables added to the model. Just check the documentation if you're not sure about all this. Lastly, uh, stacking flags. You can set the stacking uh, flag to be true or false. You can get an extra boost to your predictive power in the model. Binning, sometimes binning helps your model. So you want to set this to true in some cases and false in other cases. But all of these are meant to improve our ability to pr produce the best model because as a data scientist, you want to uh, tune your model, and this is what uh, we, we do here. Um, imbalance flag, this is in case your bad data is imbalanced, you can set the flag to true. Most of the time I set it to false, uh, but you can set it to true and it will do a, a great job uh, with imbalanced data sets. So let's take a look at uh, how out of the model works. So here's uh, an example data set from the Boston Housing. Um, it's got 500 rows and 14 variables. Um, as I set the feature reduction flag to be true, it immediately reduced the number of features by 24%. It took six seconds to build a model, and the number of variables it selected was 10 out of 14. And the 10 variables it selected, the top variable was room. If those of you who know the Boston Housing data set know that's a, that's a pretty good insight right there that the room uh, second, we saw that LSTAT was an important variable because it had a very high correlation to median value. And same NOx, which is a very complex variable that's got nonlinear um, correlation to other variables. So from this, we can see that it's a pretty good model that when you have the top three variables uh, to be something that a data scientist would have figured out on their own. 
So let's look at the results. So here's the top three variables, LSTAT, PT ratio, and then uh, we've got um, uh, uh, room and uh, so on. Okay. Here's the results, LSTAT, room, PT ratio, tax. So when we first use a linear model, it's showing us a, a different set of feature importance. And you can see here that the, um, the normalized RMSC is about 74%, which is not a very good model. A linear model is not a good choice. If you take a look at a random forest model, you then see that the random forest model improves and your uh, normalized RMSC comes down to 62%. This is a, a, a chart of the predicted versus actual, and it's pretty much on this line, though there's a, a small outliers here. <clears throat> Finally, you, when you move to an XG boost model, these are the results you're gonna get. You are seeing that the model improves quite a bit, and the uh, RMSC starts to uh, fall as the you know, number of uh, uh, parameters that is choosing, choosing start to increase. Now the time taken for this target still model was only 44 seconds. So you're able to build a model within in 44 seconds on a Boston data set. And that's a you know, great improvement from you on a starting to write code, understanding data, figuring out which features are important and so on and so forth. All of this is done by AutoML for you. But uh, wait, I haven't told you, uh, there's some more. <clears throat> With AutoML, you can actually try multiple models. You've got linear models with interaction variables, so you get one set of results. Then you can try a random forest with binning the numeric variable. You get a, a slightly different, uh, better model. You can try an ensemble model with binning, and you get a different, um, you know, that model appears to be very similar to this random forest model. And finally, you can use XGBoost, and that, with stacking, that provides you a, a slightly different uh, set of results. So you can see how uh, you can very quickly try various models by using the same line of code with just a simple change in the, in the arguments, input arguments. So finally, um, I'm going to um, show you the Wisconsin breast cancer data set. The Wisconsin breast cancer is a complex data set. And there was uh, an example of uh, uh, a person who's used carrots in deep learning on the Wisconsin data set. And I provided that link here. And you can see that this uh, Wisconsin data set um, using AutoML produced a F1 score of 100% um, on, on, uh, on the data that was given. And the time it took was about you know, uh, 12 seconds. And you can see the ROCAC curve that was provided, produced by, um, produced by out of ML. Uh, but this, if you see the link by this uh, person, um, it was trying to do about 97% or so uh, in terms of accuracy and so on. Whereas with out of ML, we are able to produce, and these are through cross validation. So it's not something that uh, I'm showing you a highly overfit model. I'm showing you results from cross validation on a test data set it has never seen, on a test that is set aside or a held out data set. And so um, it took about uh, 12 seconds with 52% uh, feature reduction. And um, so you, I hope you can see that it's a pretty good uh, result. So now we are going to go to the demo and um, we are going to see the screen. I'm going to uh, switch my screen. So first we are going to see AutoViz. <clears throat> so um, as I uh, sh shared earlier, I'm going to restart the kernel. <clears throat> so you can see how long it takes uh, in real time. The data set I've chosen is the Boston housing data set, which you can download. Uh, from UCI machine learning repository. Many of you might already have it. Um, and all you have to do is this one line import from autovis class, import class, and it takes about a few seconds on my laptop. And then you give it the Boston CSV file, you give it the target, you give it the separator that's used, it's a tab separator, and then you can ask your, um, Pandas data frame to be showed on the screen. 
And then you should just say, DFT, Autovis, run this and show it to me. So now Autovis starts churning, and you can see that it's showing you that it's seen 13 predictors in the data set. It includes a target variable, and it took eight seconds to uh, display the results. So the first uh, set of results you're going to see is the scatter plot, like I said, of every variable against the target variable. So the crime uh, against median value is yeah. not so great um, correlation. But if you go down and look at the room, the room against median value has got a high correlation to the target variable. Similarly, age has got somewhat of a nonlinear correlation. Uh, and you can see that LSTAT has a pretty strong nonlinear correlation to, uh, to the target variable. Next, you're going to see each variable against another variable. So this is known as a pairwise scatter plot. And you're going to see each variable against another variable. And this can go on and on depending on how many variables you have in your data set. And you can see that Knox has got a very strong um, you know, correlation, but it's nonlinear to age. And Knox has a similar non uh, you know, highly non-correlation to, to. So you, you can scroll down and see all of this. And then you can see each variable has its own distribution chart. So you can see that the Charles River uh, is a one or a zero. It's a Boolean variable. And we can see that there are 400 uh, rows that are um, having Chaz of zero. And then about 50 rows have about Chaz of one. Similarly, the distribution of the Chaz, uh, then the RAD. I, I show you pretty much every variable um, and it's a, a you know, histogram or KDE plot. Then you can see its violent plots. Then you can see the um, heat map of each variable against itself, against others. Then you can see bar charts of the average median value by uh, certain um, variables uh, that are categorical, like RAD and tax. And um, finally, we've got Chaz. So you can see bar charts that are very helpful for you to understand uh, how this uh, data set is, uh, you know, uh, able to describe the problem that you're trying to solve. So I hope that was uh, helpful. Um, let me just pause here and take some questions. So um, there are questions about boosting and binning. Um, when, I, um, when I show the um, out of email, I, I will do that. Any questions on, um, on auto viz that you would like to post? Okay. What about missing values? So in Autovis, uh, missing values, um, uh, it will actually, yeah, um, I don't know how PBI works uh, in missing values, but um, we deal with missing values by uh, placing uh, a flag that it is missing, and that's all it is. So um, you uh, don't have to do anything um, for missing values. It, automatically places a, 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 a non-numeric a value or a numeric value that's not found in the data in order for it to be detected as a missing value. So it uh, fills that. It does not do mean, median, or mode, which may bias the data set further. So it actually sets a missing value to a unique value that's not found in the data set so that it can be flagged as a missing value and then analyzed. So uh, what's the maximum number of rows that Autovis can handle? Autovis technically can handle as big a data set as you can import into a Pandas data frame. So if you had, let's say, a billion rows, it will still analyze uh, uh, you know, a sample of that data. So the maximum rows that it's analyzing here is 150,000. The maximum columns it's analyzing is 30, as you can see here on the screen. You can change this by setting the max rows analyzed to be 1 million, 2 million, whatever you feel that's needed. But if you set it to a billion, it might take perhaps forever to run in, the, in your laptop. Unless you have very powerful servers, you're not going to be able to visualize a billion rows on a simple laptop. But there is almost no limit because AutoViz was designed to help you set these values yourself. So you can set these values to as high as you want, and it will take an automatic uh, sample of that data. 
And uh, it, uh, it deals with categorical columns. Um, if text is there, it uh, uses text values also. So, um, uh, you know, I don't know if I have a, a data set. Uh, wine quality. I don't know if I have wine quality, but um, let's see. Yeah, I don't have um, a wine quality, but if you wanted to, you can um, take a look at Iris um, data sets. You can see that the Iris data set is there and you can just change it and run it. So you, it will run them all um, as shown here and it will uh, vary depending on what problem uh, it's trying to do. So the target variable in this case is class. So um, here it is running for the iris data set. And you can see that the iris data set has got a slightly different set of charts. And for the sepal width against each class, zero, one, or two, you can see that the sepal length varies. And I've given it a slight jitter of 5%. So with that jitter, you can see that these variables are uh, petal length is able to segregate them into three classes. So um, this is how you're um, able to visualize the iris uh, data set, which is very different looking from your uh, other data set. So let me uh, go to chats. Another question, there are long text columns for comments. It will ignore those. So if you have long text, it will ignore those columns and it will not visualize them. So you won't have a problem. So um, it avoids overfitting by using cross validation and you are in control in the sense that if you feel like the number of uh, cross validation steps needs to be 10, you can go to the code and actually change uh, a simple place where it, uh, I'll show you that that can do the cross validation change. Now I'm going to stop the auto -biz and I'm going to go to auto -vimel and I'm going to show you a demo. Uh, this data set uh, is the same uh, Boston housing um, data set. I want to thank UCI machine learning repository for that. Um, so if you were to import the Boston uh, data set, it'll look like this and uh, we, are you know artificially split it into test and train, and we are now going to feed that into AutoML. And as you can see, AutoML starts to immediately work on it, and there are no missing values in this. But if there were missing values, it will, like I said, fill that. Um, now we are using a very simple model. In this case, we're using a, a linear model. So you can see here it says here linear model, and you can see the results. The RMSC score is about 44%. Um, and um, if you also set the ensembling to be true, it will, uh, the stacking, if you set it to false, it means it will do ensembling. If you set it to true, it will do stacking. So you can set it to uh, do anything you want. And in this particular case, uh, uh, AutoVML tells you that the single model is better than ensembling models for this data set. And you can see the feature importances are, are different. Like I said, LSTAT and ROOM are the two most important. PT ratio is the next one. Since we've set aside a small data set for test, I'm going to see if indeed that is uh, helpful. So if you take a linear uh, model, you should set the model name to be linear. And you can see that on the test data set, it performs just as well as it performed on the previous data set. The normalized RMSC is 48. In the validation, we saw that it was around 44. So whatever you are doing, you're going to get similar results uh, from validation and test. I'm now going to uh, test this on a slightly uh, different data set, which is the breast uh, cancer. The breast cancer data set has a different target variable called diagnosis. And it's got uh, a separator as a comma. So it's not able to uh, find, uh, okay, so the breast cancer data set in this uh, case is uh, somewhat different. Um, 
let me try a different data set. Um, so I'll try the iris. So in the, with the iris data set, once again, um, we are going to try and it will take you less than a few seconds um, just um, to train the data model and you can see that it's running. <clears throat> Any questions on out of ML? <clears throat> so you can see that um, it's done a pretty good job except for the uh, class zero. Um, it's a confusion matrix here and you can see the ROC AC and we are now going to um, use the test data that we have set aside and you can see that this model um, does a perfect 100% on the test data set. So even though you are going to get a, a cross validation score that might appear to be slightly low, I have designed out of ML such that the real world results will be at least as good as what you see in the validation, if not better in your test. So that way the person who a data scientist can feel comfortable that what he's going to see in validation is going to be very similar if not better in the test data set that he has to set aside yeah so this is a great uh, question about there are six flags that make it very powerful but there are lots and lots of choices rom can you um, do something about it? Um, so I will show you how I run Autoviz 99% um, of the time. I basically let all of the uh, values that are set and I just run it without changing any of the default parameters because the default parameters are meant to provide you the best model. So you can see here that with just the default values, you will get a pretty good model, all right? And, um, and it takes about, the entire process takes about, uh, for the iris data set, about 16 seconds, um, right? Or 18 seconds. So you should be comfortable with the results that you're getting from the default model, and um, that's where you uh, should go. So somebody asked a question about where do you find the GitHub repo? I'm going to go back to our, uh, right, our, uh, there's another demo. So the GitHub repo, So here's the GitHub repo. It's www.github.com, auto Vimal and auto underscore Vimal. So you can use that. Um, the last thing I want to show you is um, auto Vimal has uh, uh, some uh, work to do. And um, there are some folks that have uh, signed up as uh, collaborators. Uh, so if you are interested, you can sign up as a collaborator by sending me an email. Um, there, what's missing in auto Vimal? There's no feature engineering. You can create your own. Uh, so before you use AutoML, do some feature engineering if you can. And even if you create a hundred more features, AutoML is going to reduce them anyway. So you're better off doing feature engineering than not doing. There's no image or video NLP support at the moment. No time series modeling. I'm building on a, a, a project called Auto Time Series, and hopefully that will come out soon. There's no neural networks or deep learning. But I suggest that you use your own model or you use tools like Ludwig, which is a pretty good tool for neural networks, or you can use TensorFlow or build your own model. And model serving. At the moment, there is no model serving. I give you the model and you can store it as a pickle file and then you can uh, you know, upload it to a, any uh, cloud provider and you can you know, serve it yourself or you can serve it in your internal uh, server. In AutoWiz, <clears throat> So, um, out of this, what more, what's missing? What could be improved? Uh, you, you should build it into existing tools in your own um, enterprise, if you can, so that everybody has access. There is a, 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 one of the person who has come up with a new 
idea of making this available in all high schools in America. So if you are interested in your high school and you want to make out of this available to your high school, just put it on a website and let all the students uh, upload their CSV file and visualize it with one click. If you're in your organization, upload out of this to your organization's website, put a button there so people can visualize data with one click. This is my dream and I'm hoping that you can, some of you can take this dream much further along. So does this tool reduce the creativity of the data scientists? No, I mean, there is still a lot of work to be done, like I've shown you here. I'm just giving you tools to be more productive. <laughs> There's still a, a tremendous amount of work to be done. Um, so I'm hoping that you can appreciate it when you, when you see the number of uh, uh, flags and, and, and tweaking that you have to do. Um, the last thing is you, I, I had, I don't have visualizations for pie charts, mosaic charts. So if you are interested in writing a simple code that you can tack on to Autovis, please send it to me and we can uh, collaborate together. And, and, and second, last, you can add this to an IOT tool, like an instrumentation box so that anybody who has instruments with data coming out can see automatically visualize it. So. That's all, uh, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And if you want to contact me, uh, here's my website. Um, what I have built is basically a very small <laughs> plant. Uh, I hope this can become a big tree by collaboration, and that's the reason why I've open sourced it. So all of you can collaborate, make, take advantage of it, and as well as collaborate to make this into a very big uh, tree. And hopefully it can benefit a lot of people. Great, thanks, uh, Ram. Uh, did we go through the questions? Yes, this is. Uh, uh, I think I've done most of it. Um, okay. And uh, somebody was the question. Actually, there are four questions in the Q and A. Uh, I assume you already go through them, right? I'm sorry. Uh, I see there are a couple of questions in the Q and A se uh, sections. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading that. And so this is um, whether it supports incremental model build. That's exactly my point. It supports incremental model building because you can change the flags and you can get incremental um, uh, one, uh, one more, uh, you know, model, one more tweak. You're never done in uh, data science. And these are just simple tools that everyone should have access to. And they should be able to um, do their job without stress, be able to do the simple tasks like this well, so that they can focus on the more complex tasks. Without tools like this, I feel like all of us are reinventing the simple wheels that if only we had had them, we can build more complex automobiles and we can build a you know, fighter jet. But all of us are very focused on doing the simple wheel building. And that's why I, I thought it would be a problem. So how do you get notified? Um, you can you know, send me an email or you can uh, put a watch on the auto uh, Vimal GitHub. And then when you put a watch, as soon as a new library is added, you will get uh, notified. So I hope this has been helpful to everyone. And I hope to do more in the future. All right, great. Well, thanks, thanks again. Um, thanks, uh, Ram, for the great presentation. And uh, I hope everyone get uh, great learning and uh, discussion. Um, we're going to have more events. Um, please check our website uh, about the webinars, the workshops, and uh, the boot camps, and also the coming up with the conference in San Francisco. Um, hope to see you guys again in the next event. I look forward to uh, producing more work in open source to the open source community. And um, 